always excited about Bible study. Seems like the word of God starts swelling up on the inside. And when it do, you want to get rid of it. You want to get it out of it. You want to share it with somebody else. So I thank God for the word that he's given us tonight and the word of prophecy that he gave us for, uh, for the year. And I know y'all don't want me to be preaching on the same thing all year long, but that's a prophecy for all year long, even though I may not be preaching on it all day long. And, you know, I got a friend that used to be a cook, and he used to uh, cook for the golf course in Wake Forest and Black Sheriff. And he told me that he figured out so many ways to prepare chicken. He said he can fry the chicken today, and if they don't sell all of it, they don't get rid of all of it, then the next day he give it to them again called fricassee. He'll put some gravy on it and just fricassee, fricassee chicken, chicken and gravy. You know, he's still eating the same chicken, but you got it a little bit different, fixed up a little bit different way. So I'm probably going to be talking about this greater in a different way for a while. I don't know until the Lord released me from it. But right now, I want you to go in your Bible to the book of Habakkuk, because we started on this on last week um, in our Sunday service, talking about the vision in Habakkuk. So let's read it, beginning at, we're going to read starting at verse number two, and read through verse four. And I'm in the King James Version. He said, and the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that, you, that he may run that read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, the soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. We're going to get our thoughts from verse number two. It said that the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that read it. Tonight we're going to talk about writing the vision. Write the vision. Write it down. There's something about putting something on pen and paper that makes a difference. I remember reading and I was planning on finding that scripture and bring it to you, but some of you probably already know when, when God gave the commandments to the children of Israel, he told them to put it where it can be seen. Put it on your doorpost. He said, put it on frontlets. Put it in places where your children can see it. And from generation to generation, they'll know the word of the Lord. They'll know the commandments of God. So don't just, you, you, you write it, you talk to them about it, you tell them about it, but you write it down. Put it in a place where, where they can see it on a regular basis. And that same principle is here about writing the vision because we've been talking about getting a vision. And you need a vision. You need a vision for yourself. You need a vision for your, your home, for your family. You need to have a vision for your ministry because being in the family of God, we have been called to work. We're not called just to be on vacation. We are called to work, and we have been given ministry gifts. And you need to know what it is that God called you to do. But the important thing is write it down. Now, in Proverbs, we're not going to look for this, but Proverbs 28 and 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. So it's important that you have a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And somebody said this in, the, in another translation where it said, where there is no vision, the people cast off constraints. So the people don't have no direction of knowing where to go. Vision is sight. And when you can't see where you're going, you're likely to end up someplace you didn't want to be. So you need to be able to see where you're going. See, so we need a vision. When we have a vision, we set goals. And we make plans on how we're going to get to where we're going, how we're going to accomplish the vision. But if you don't have a vision, that's why a lot of times we tell our church, that, what you want to be when you get grown? We want them to have a vision. If they say, I want to be a teacher, well, they know that there are certain things that they got to learn. If they say, I want to be a doctor, certain things they got to learn to prepare to be that. So they need a vision. That's why we ask them that. And, and children probably get tired of you hearing you say that. But most of the time when, a child, when, when somebody see a child is still in school, they ask them, what you want to be when you get grown? Why you ask them that? Because you want them to get a vision. 
you want them to get something in their head that they a goal that they're going after. Because if you have a goal, you know they take preparation. See, you don't become a teacher just because you want to teach. You don't become a doctor just because you feel like you can cut somebody. See, well, whatever it is that you want to be, you make preparation. And so God has given us the prophecy for this year, for this ministry, and for anybody else that will receive it, the prophecy is greater. So we need a vision in our, in our mind. We need a vision in our hearts on what that greater look like. So it's important for us to have a vision, like I said, for our life, our own personal life. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to be? What do you want to accomplish with the days you got left here on earth? What is your vision? See, uh, that's why uh, uh, our, our uh, I was talking about Sister Owynthia, how she was working, but she went back to college because she wasn't satisfied. She wanted more. See, if you want more, you have to do more. See, and you have to have a vision in your mind of what you want to be, what you want to do, then find out what it takes in order to make that vision come to pass. And we need a vision for our family. And I, I, I keep saying this because God put this in my spirit and I talked to our men. Our family should be our first business, our first ministry. Because we are called to minister. And the word minister is to serve. So we need to have a vision for our family. I remember um, my wife and I, we were raising our children. And we got saved at an early age. We were like 22 years old when we got saved. And the Lord began to bless us with the children. And we would take our children to the house of God. And we would begin to be faithful in the things of God and we love God but we love God but we also have a vision for our children and my vision for my children is that they grow up to know God for themselves I want every one of my children to have their own personal relationship I don't want their relationship with God to be through me you know I, I, I want to be the example as best I can I want to be a role model for them but I want them to have their own personal relationship with God and I want it not just for my children, but I want it for children, for my children's children, from generation to generation. I want all of my children to ch and grandchildren and all the way down the road, I want them to walk in blessings. See? And so and if I want that for my children, then I got to do things to take my, point my children in that direction. I got to be bringing them to the house of God. I can't let the television raise my children. I, they got to get some word in them if they're a personal relationship with God, they need to have some word in them. And I don't give them a choice as to whether or not they want to go to church. Selah. If so many people say, well, I'm, I let them, when they get big enough, they can decide. No, when they get big enough, they're going to decide wrong because you didn't train them up the way they were supposed to be while they was growing up. While you got them in your care, you need to do what it takes to point them in the right direction. You can't make them go in the right direction, but you got to give them some direction. You got to point them that way. Bring them up in the house of God. Bring them up where they can hear the word of God. And people talk about how you got hypocrites in the church. Yeah, you got hypocrites in the church. Jesus had a hypocrite right there with him. The Bible says he had 12 disciples, and one of them was a the devil. So don't, don't, don't let that be used as an excuse for not bringing your children to church. Bring them to the house of God so that they can learn the word of God. So that's what we did. And so we thank the Lord. I thank the Lord right now, all of them that we raised confess to have a right relationship with God. And none of us know anybody else's heart, but from what I can see, I believe that they do. And so you got to have a vision for your family. And my vision for my family also is that, that when I walk in the house, I want my wife to be glad to see me. I don't want to be well when I walk in the house, the children go in one direction and the wife in another direction, and you by yourself in the room by yourself. I want everybody to be glad I'm, in, I'm home. I remember that when I left the railroad, I got a job in uh, Atlanta. And I came home on the weekends. And my children say they can be sitting in the house and they hear the car pull up in the driveway. And as soon as they hear the car pull up, my wife jump up and start running. She, they, they tell her, say, Mama, she, she coming in the house. You ain't got, <laughs> you ain't got.
got me running out there, you know. He coming in the house, but she was ready for me to get home. And you know what? I was ready to get home too. Amen. Amen. And see, what you need to do is uh, when you're in your family, you know, what we do too many times is we wrap ourselves around our children. You know, we, and, and we, don't, we build a relationship with our children. And then when the children gone, you didn't build a relationship with each other. And so now the children are gone, what you're going to do now? So we told our children, we used to have uh, family prayer every Saturday night at our house. We would turn the TV off. We didn't have cell phones back then, but we'd take the phone off the hook, and we would go into the den, and we would have family prayer. We would, we would pray. We would study the Sunday school lesson because we were Sunday school people. We brought them to Sunday school just like we brought them to church. And uh, so they would get the word of God. And then we would open it up like having conversation among ourselves. And that way we, our children learn to talk to us. When they have a problem, they don't run to somebody else. They run to us. Even now, because they learn to talk to us. They learn that they can say anything they want to say. During that setting, they can say anything they want to say. They just had to stare to be polite how to say it. But anything that they wanted to say, anything that was on their mind, anything that was bothering them, they knew they could say it in that family time. And that's the way you find out what your children are thinking. See, the only way you can know what they're thinking is they tell you. You can't anticipate what somebody is thinking. So they would, she, they, our children got where they would open up and they would tell us. If things happen in school, they would come and tell us what happened. Things happen in the home, well, even if I did something, they thought I did something wrong, they bring it up, and I think, well, hey, I'm the daddy, but I ain't perfect. I mess up, too, so if I mess up, let me know, and I'll try to straighten up. And so our children grew up with the kind of relationship that they could always come to us. They don't go to Joe Blow out in the street. They don't go to some kind of gangster out in the street. They'll come to us, see, and so we built that. We, that was our plan for our family, that we would have a close-knit family. We could talk to one another. We could work things out. Even after my children got grown, they would still come to me. And my daughter, she used to come to me and tell me some things I wasn't ready for. Amen. You know, you can talk to your son about stuff, but when your, when your daughter can talk to you about personal stuff, and in my mind, I was saying, baby, I really don't want to hear this. <laughs> but we train them to come to us. <laughs> and so that's the, way, that's the way we raise them. That was our vision for our family. You need to have a vision for your ministry. If you are in the body of Christ, you have been called. You have a gift. When God saved you, he equipped you. You have an assignment. You may not know what the assignment is yet, but God gave you an assignment. And so you need to, to find out what your assignment is in the body of Christ. If you are a hand, you don't need to be acting like the feet. If your hand act like your feet, then what you going to do when you get ready to go somewhere? You're going to walk on your hands? See, the hands have an assignment. The feet have an assignment. Every part of your body has an assignment. And the body re relates the body of Christ as like a, a, back, as a body. Many members, but one body. Everybody don't have the same office. Everybody can't usher. Now, y'all might take that as a light thing. But you got to have the right personality to usher. I have been to church and the usher ran me off. Because they're going to tell me what to do. They're going to tell me where I'm going to sit. I say, well, I don't want to sit there. But you, 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 you're a minister. I want you to go up on the pulpit. I say, I don't want to go up there. But you, I turned around and left. I just went home. Now, I might could have handled that a better way. But, but he had the wrong personality. You ain't going to tell me what. I mean, the, the usher is supposed to be, uh, 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 they know that that's a servant position. You're supposed to try to make people comfortable. You're supposed to approach people with the right kindness. You don't talk to people any kind of way if you were usher. You got to have the right personality. And so here, if you ain't got the right personality, you don't need to be in the, uh, in the usher position because you can't represent this house. Amen. We represent this house with love and kindness. See? And so no matter what the position is in the house, it's important. Everybody's important. So you need to know what your ministry is. Amen. Amen. See, you, well, uh, you have to have a vision of what you want your house to look like. It needs to be a place of love, peace, and prosperity. Amen. 
See, and now this is talking about, we're talking about right and division. Now, we realize that most of us don't always have a vision or have not always had a vision. In order to have a vision, we need to first of all seek God and ask him to give us the vision that he desires for our life. When we do what God designed us to do, we'll be better at it. There are some people who say, well, I just can't work in children's church. Well, you don't need to be in children's church. You need to be somewhere else. See, God, but there are other people that just love to work with children. That's the anointing that's on their life. So you need, we all need to find out what God has called us to do. We all need to have a vision of what we're going to do, where we're going to be, and, and, and how to keep carry it out. And see, if God gives you a vision, he always gives you provision. He always gives you everything that you need to carry out the vision. Now, I wrote down this question that says, how do we know when our vision comes from God? And it's not just our own desires. Well, I wrote down three things that we can, we can look at to find out so we can know what our vision is. Number one is God's vision for you will always be in agreement with the word of God. God will never tell you to do something that is contrary to the written word of God. If you feel like you're supposed to do something and it doesn't line up with the word of God, it did not come from God. Number two is God's vision for you <laughs> will always require help from God. You won't be able to accomplish it on your own. It'll be too big. You can't do it on your own. If it's something that you can do on your own, it didn't come from God. I heard Pastor Thrift uh, on, on, uh, on Friday night. He says, if your vision don't scare you, it didn't come from God. <laughs> now, I, I put a pin in that. Because sometimes the, the things that God gives you seem so big that you say, well, Lord, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see that. I, I can't, I, I don't know how, I don't, I'm just not able to do that. And then you know, if God gave it to you, you know you need God help to help you do it. And I can be a witness to that, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Because when God gave me the vision for, um, for Evergreen Church, we had probably about maybe 25 or 30 members, something like that. And God told me to build a sanctuary for 500 people. Well, now, and the first thing in my mind is, Lord, why do we need a building that will, uh, that will accompany 500 plus people? And so it, it, seemed like, it seemed like to me it was kind of utterly ridiculous, but I knew I had heard from God, and I knew I couldn't do it without God. Now, when God give you the vision, you need to write it down. Write it down. So when you write it down, you won't lose focus. Because if you don't write it down, you'll lose focus. So you need to write it down so that you won't lose focus on what you're doing and where you're headed. Number three is listen in your spirit for revelation from God. He will speak to you with an unction. 1 John 2, verses 2, 20 and 21. Let's look at that. 1 John. First John chapter number 2. And let's drop down to verse 20. It says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Did y'all know you already, that there's something on the inside of you that knows everything? Do you know that the spirit of the living God, the one that created the universe, is on the inside of you? And he knows everything, and you have access to the one that knows everything? You have an unction from God. He said, I've written unto you not because you know not the truth, but because you know it and no lies in the truth. When you hear the truth, you ought to be able to identify with it because the spirit on the inside of you 
So God will give you an unction. An unction is an anointing. Uh, an unction is a supernatural ability to get the job done, and you need that. Anytime God gives you something to do, you're going to need his help in getting it done. Sometimes we have to take small steps, but that's all right. Just keep moving in the right direction. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look, starting at verse number 35. He says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Yet for a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. That sounds like the same thing Habakkuk said. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Then he back it up and says, but we are not of them who draw back into prediction. But we are them that believe that the saving of the soul. The vision that God gives you for yourself might seem like it is not within reach. And seem like sometimes you're stuck. You're not moving at all. That's why it's important that you have the vision written down so you can still be encouraged during those dormant times. During those times whenever it looked like God is not doing anything. I heard, I think it was Pastor Jamal Bryant, I believe that was him, he said when God is doing nothing, he's doing something. <laughs> because see, when you got a seed in the ground, it looked like it's doing nothing. You don't see anything going on because it's underground. But while it's underground, it is germinating. While it's underground, it is beginning to prepare to break up through the ground. The seed is being prepared, but you don't see anything. And the Bible said that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that a man sow in the ground, and he say he, he go night and day and not knowing what's going on. He say, but the ground know what to do with the seed. And then first, the ground will pop up and say, then first is the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear, and then the harvest. And so during that dormant time, when it looked like God is doing nothing, you got to have something else to hold on to because you can't walk by your sight because you don't see nothing. But you got to have it in your spirit to know that God will do what he said he'll do. You got to hold on to your confidence. Confidence is faith in God. Confidence is knowing that God, whatever God said he'll do, he is able also to do it. Whatever God promised, he's also able to perform. And so there are dormant times that you just have to hold on. There are dormant times you ain't got nothing but your faith because you don't see nothing. You don't hear nothing. And we had some dormant times here in this ministry. But you know, I went back over, and that's why I asked you in the, um, in the beginning, how many of you all know the, uh, the purpose statements by heart, already got them in your heart? Now, I was intending on saying this on Sunday, but I forgot. 27 years ago, on last Sunday, I became the pastor of Evergreen Church. 27 years ago. And that was on last Sunday. It was the fifth Sunday in January in 1995 that I came here the first time as pastor. On that fourth Sunday, I spoke um, for the service. And Deacon Bob had already talked to me and Sister, uh, Bain, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Wanda had already talked to me about taking on the position as pastor. And I think it was probably about maybe two or three years later when I came back to, to do a service for them uh, Deacon Bob brought it up again to me before service and I had already been praying about it and the Lord had already given me the okay. So I told him, I said, well, after service, uh, have a meeting and see how the rest of the congregation feel about it and see what you all think and then let me know. So he called me later on that evening and told me, say, Pastor, say, um, 
So you are our next pastor. You are our pastor. And I said, all right. So that was on the fourth Sunday after service and everything. So when I came back that, su that next Sunday, which was the fifth Sunday, that was my first Sunday back as pastor. So my real anniversary was last Sunday. But my anniversary is celebrated in April, on the fourth Sunday in April, because I think that is the time when I was actually installed as the pastor. See, that's when it was made formal and official. Uh, on the, I believe it was on the fourth Sunday. So my, my anniversary is celebrated on the fourth Sunday. But God gave me a vision for the ministry. And the vision was so large. Let me ask y'all, how many of y'all was in here before we first, when I first came? You wasn't in here. You must have been one of them that was, that was a hat. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You, you were one of them that, that you might have been on the road. Okay. But now, how many of y'all that were here, be honest, how many of you could see us being where we are today when we first got here? Could you see that? Did you have any thought or any idea that we would be where we are today? Well, that was the vision that God gave me some 20-something years ago. And, 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 and the vision was so, was so huge that the Lord did not allow me to just tell it to the congregation. If I would have told them we had about maybe 25, maybe 30 people that was coming from time to time, not every Sunday, but you know from time to time, and we weren't having church every Sunday. We was having church on what? Second and fourth Sundays. We just had church on second and fourth Sundays. And now you come and tell somebody we're going to build a building for 500 people. I would, they will laugh me out of town. But God told me to just give them the vision in pieces. So what I told them, first of all, is that we are going to improve on what we have. So what we did was we basically kind of remodeled what we had. We cleaned up the land around it and we refurbished the walls and everything on the inside and and then we we added on the uh, the fellowship hall and things like that and once the people saw what was going on not only did i have a vision but they had the vision too they could see us doing that and then the lord blessed us where the we had so many people coming out here that we actually didn't have sufficient room in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary. And so what we did was we started having church in the fellowship hall. And so now they can see us growing. See, and God showed me that because I say, Lord, how are we going to, what do we need? How are we going to, to, to have a ministry with 500 plus people? And, and, and I did a survey and I found out that in Bristol, there were not 500 people in the whole town. And you know you ain't going to get all the white folk. You don't get none of them hardly in Bristol. And you ain't going to get very many Hispanic, in you, or if any, in Bristol. And so, Lord, what, what do you mean to build it? And the Lord let me know there are 12 towns within a 30-mile radius of where the building is that he's going to send people. And God began to do it. He began to send people. And so then as God began to do that, then we could reveal the full vision to the people. And the people got the vision in their heart. And, and I thank God for the people because sometimes I was feeling a little bit discouraged, but I didn't tell them. And they acted like they were on fire. Even We had a period where we, were, we, we, we laid this foundation. See, when we did the first part, we build the, um, the fellowship hall and the restrooms and the offices over there and things like that. That happened real fast. That was in three years. We had a 15-year contract with the bank to pay it off, and we paid it off in three years. And that encouraged me, and I said, well, Lord, we're going to jump on this. I thought we were going to be through with everything in five years. But when we got over here and we laid the foundation, we had a concrete slab sitting out there, and that concrete slab sat there for four years before we did anything. And then when we finally did build up some walls after four years where the concrete had begun to crack and, and, and separate, so we had to redo some of the concrete. 
And then we put some walls up, and a, and a storm came and blew the walls down. And so, you know, it, it was kind of discouraging. But what I'm, let me get back to my point. My point is, write the vision. So what happened between all that time, God began to give me a vision for the church. And the vision is showing up in our purpose statements. Now, our purpose statements are the vision that God gave me for this ministry. And so we're going to back up and look at the purpose statements and see where we come from and see how much further we got to go. Because this is the vision. I'm telling you, when you look at our purpose statements, and I had not even thought about, see, none of this came out of a book. Everything that we have as our purpose statements, as our confession, was given to me by the Holy Spirit for this ministry. God gave it to us. All right, now let's go back to the purpose statement. We got, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take an extra 10 minutes to do this. All right, our mission statement says, put that up for me, Deacon, the purpose statements. Our mission statement says, going into all the world, preaching the gospel, winning souls for the kingdom of Christ Jesus. Okay, uh, don't keep it up there, Deacon, because I don't want the people on Facebook just look at that on. Okay, so what we're looking at, it says, the first thing is going into all the world. Well, whenever God gave me that, my thinking was um, we would teach the word of God in the building and then each one of us will go out into the world and carry what we learn from the house of God. That was my perception of going into the world. But you know what? When Facebook came along and YouTube came along, then now I can better see how the gospel would be going into all the world. Because my vision was short, because that, those tools were not even available then. But how many know God knew they were going to be available? Yeah. Amen. And then the next one says, our value statement. Moved by compassion, motivated to help meet the spiritual, physical, and financial needs of this and surrounding communities as the body of Christ. We do that. We have in our, um, in our mission, that God gave us our benevolent fund ministry. Now, our benevolent fund ministry, I don't know if any other church, like a long time ago, they used to do that called the ushers offering or whatever, something like that. But we do a separate offering, and that offering is specifically, the benevolent fund ministry is to go in and help other people that are in need. And not just people in the ministry, but in, in the community. Evergreen Church helps. The, the Bud Newton Center down there has a, uh, it's a, it's a community building, and it's got a lot of potential to it, but we contribute to it because that's a local ministry. And then what we do is every Sunday, we send money to uh, Life Outreach Ministry, James Robinson, and what they do is they feed people in Africa and in, in India. They preach the gospel to them. They provide uh, fresh water and they provide huts and same places for them to live. Well, we not, that's not our job. That God's not part of our assignment. So we help somebody else do what we're not doing. So we're reaching not just um, people in our community, in, in our thing, but in, in the whole community. So we're reaching people and we are effective. See, if, if the church closed the door, if you're not doing anything, and you, church, and you close the church doors, the community won't even know you were there. I want Evergreen Church to be noticed. I want people, do you know that there are people that know about Evergreen Church that's all over the area and people that know me and associate me with Evergreen Church? And we're, right out, we're way out here in the middle of somewhere? Amen. Because we make an impact upon the community financially and spiritually and, 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 uh, and physically. We make an impact. Okay, our vision statement says we envision a body of believers operating under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit with the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is one that we are we got we got to do better. I mean, we already operating in it, but we need to. We, that's one of the areas we got to reach in greater. Operating under the power 
and influence of the Holy Spirit. Then it says, with the manifestation. Not just have the Holy Spirit. There should be some manifestation. There should be some evidence that we are the people of God. Okay, our goals. It says evangelize and recruit membership. Did I skip something? No. Okay, evangelize and recruit membership within a 30-mile radius of our existing building. Now, we know that there were, uh, God has given me 12 towns, and I believe right now we probably have membership in about 10 of those towns. We did have uh, one or two more, like we had, I think Brantley County was one of them, Bikesley was, was one of them, that we had members, but something happened, they died off or something like that. Ma'am? That's right. Okay. All right. Well, that's Hoboken. I was thinking Nahana. Okay. But anyway, we had some in Nahana where somebody came. Anyway, in the 12, the 12 towns within the 30 mile radius, and then God being the big God that he is, he reached out further than that. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have family that come, used to come from Kingsland every Sunday and, uh, and, and other places, Jacksonville. Some used to come from Jacksonville, Savannah. See? And so God got people coming to the ministry. And God let me know it's like a restaurant. If you prepare good food, people will find you. And there are people that have a hunger for the word of God. And, and, and I thank God for the anointing that he has given us in this ministry. Not just me, but all of you in here that God has, has anointed for that, that same uh, anointing flows. And people want to hear the word of God. People want God, they want to hear the word of God without sugar to add it to it. They want to hear the unadulterated word of God because they want to do right and they want to be right. So that's one of the things that we are, uh, is recruiting membership. Okay, number two says produce a ministry. This is another one. Produce a ministry of spiritually mature Christians. Let me back up. Produce a ministry of spiritually mature Christians, spiritually mature Christians, not babies. See, you start out as babies. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we are. We are. There, there are. there are some people in here I would trust with my life, and, and, and I trust your prayers because you're spiritually mature, and we want anybody that come in here to grow to that point. You start out as babies, but you don't need to stay a baby, and if you be under the word of God, see, that's why I... I it, it, it breaks my heart not to see any more than what's coming to Bible study because that let me know you don't have that hunger. We only come to church twice a week, twice a month, twice a week in this ministry. We do Sunday, one Sunday on service, on, we do one service on Sunday, and then Bible study. And we hold Bible study down to no more than an hour and a half. I try to, let, try to do it about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. You can't give God that much time. You home watching TV? You home, you shouldn't even be home watching on Facebook. Not if you're a member. You need to be in the house of God. You need to have a hunger for God and for the things of God. That's the only way you're going to grow. Paul told the, I don't I think say Paul, but the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews told the people, say, for the time that you've been here, you ought to be teachers rather than having being taught. He said, I can't even feed you with meat. I have to feed you with milk. For the time you've been in here, you ought to know better. For the time you've been in here, you ought to still be stumbling over the same things. Getting mad because somebody say your mama. Getting mad because somebody parked in your parking space. Getting mad because somebody sat in your seat. Getting mad because somebody looked at you funny. Getting mad because when you, when you walked up, they stopped talking. Oh, that's baby stuff. You need to get past all of that. Become spiritually mature. And then it says, not only spiritually mature, but spiritually that will fulfill the commission given to the church by our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to come in here and get the word of God and then take that word back out. That's what we're supposed to do. And then the third one says, build a ministry that includes 500 or more people God is the one that said that 500 or more, fighting the good fight of faith, laying hold of eternal life, taking victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, 
to the glory of God. That's the vision. We wrote it down. And that's why we keep saying it. That's why we keep bringing it over. When we were having Sunday school, we were saying it in Sunday school. Every Sunday we say it in church. Why? You're supposed to write the vision, make it plain, so that they that hear it can do it. They can run with it. Make it plain. Don't make it complicated. There's nothing complicated about our vision. All we have to do is learn and just keep moving and keep doing it. And if we're not where we're supposed to be, that's because we're in the process of getting there. Now that's as a ministry. That's what we are together. Now, what we are individually, let's look at our confession. You see, together we have a ministry, and then individually we have a ministry. So our confession is our vision for ourselves. See, we got a vision for the whole body, but we also got a vision for ourselves. That's why we do our confession. Our confession says, I have potential. I recognize that there's something on the inside of me that's greater than what I can see. There's something on the inside of me greater than what you can see, but it's on the inside of me, and I'm, re- and I'm going toward it. That's potential. Then it said, the power of God is at work in me. See, it's not just the power of God is in me, but the power of God is at work in me. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, how? According to the power that works in me. Not just the power that's on the inside of me, but the power that's working. So we say by faith that the power of God is at work in me. Then if we make a confession about who we are, we start speaking into our own lives and say, I am prophesied to myself. I am who God says. I'm, I'm agreeing with God that I am who God says I am. I do what God says I can do. I have what God says I can have. I'm prophesying. I'm speaking by faith. I might not be it in the natural. You might not see it, but it's on the inside of me, that potential, and it's coming out of me. I speak it for out of my life. Then it says, I am a warrior. I am a winner. I am a child. I'm, I'm prophesying to myself. I'm telling you who I am. I'm telling myself who I am. I identify myself not as a loser, but I'm a winner. Not as a quitter, but I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior, and I'm a champion because I don't quit. I don't give up. That's how I identify myself. And then I say, I can do all things, not under my own power and not by my own intellect, but I can do all things because it's Christ that's on the inside of me, that's giving me strength to do. So write the vision. Write it down. Write down your vision for yourself. Write down your vision for your family your vision for your ministry and make it plain. Amen. All right. We thank God for y'all tonight. We hope you were blessed. We talk about writing the vision. Write it down so it'll be in front of you. I have, I have, I have all kind of notes and stuff that I have written for myself. And I got two on my, on my desk right now and I see about every day when I walk in there. One of them is the Lord showed me I need to slow down and focus. I try to move too fast. And the Lord let me know you need to slow down. And then when you slow down, you can focus. And then another thing I got on my desk is I am a patient man. Because I, I get impatient. But I, I tell myself I'm a patient man. Whenever I start driving and look like the traffic is slow, I say I'm a patient man. I tell myself that. <laughs> I do. I speak it to myself. I speak it in my spirit. I get in the grocery line and I be impatient. I, I, you know you got to wait. And so I just say, Lord, I tell, I'm a patient man. I tell myself that. So what do you tell yourself? I think one of the preachers brought that up on, on during the revival. What about your self-talk? I think it was Bishop James. Your self-talk. What do you say to yourself? What do you say about yourself? So you need to let God give you a confession out of the word of God. What I am. One of my confessions was that I am a man of God. I preach the word of God with power. And when I preach the word, souls are saved. Lives are changed. People are healed. I, I, I say that. I wrote it down so I could see it. And then when you see it 
on paper, you can see yourself doing it. And then whenever you seem like you start to, to, to falter it, you see it, there it is. Remind you, get you back on track. Father God, we thank you today for your word. We know, Father God, you have greater things in store for us than what we can ever imagine. But Lord, we know we can do it if you tell us. If you signed us to do it, you equipped us to do it. So we thank you for the vision right now. We thank you for the greater that's coming in our lives. We're not satisfied. We're not content, Lord God. We're not complacent. We have a hunger for you and for the things of God. And Lord, we want to please you with our life. Father God, help us to pull off the world and not be attached to anything that's in it. Realizing, Father God, everything in the world is passing away. Everything in the world, Father God, will come to an end one day. But your word will never come to an end. Your kingdom will never come to an end. Your kingdom will last forever. Help us, Father God, to be what we need to be, do what we need to do, have what we need to have, and give you the glory for everything that come out of our lives. We thank you, Father. We believe we receive it. We give you praise, honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And we want to say to anybody that have not yet met Jesus Christ, Lord, and Savior, I'm not talking about because you go to church. It's different between going to church. I went to church all my life. When I was growing up, I went to church. My grandma and them sent me to church, and took me to church and all kind of stuff, but it, I wasn't nothing. I mean, I was still, I, I went to church, but the church wasn't in me. So it's not because you joined the church at a certain age. It's do you have a right relationship with God? Have you invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart, be your Lord, and be your Savior? Salvation is so simple that people miss it. But God made it simple because he wants you to have it. He made it easy because he wants you to have it. Jesus took all of the work out of salvation. All you got to do is believe and receive. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he will save you. He made salvation just that simple. A simple prayer can change your life from being a child of Satan to being a child of God. And nobody want to claim that they're a child of Satan, but anybody that's not a child of God, you are a child of Satan. It's time for you to change families. Amen. Amen. You need to be adopted into the family of God, born by the Spirit of God, and God will do it. All right, we thank you, and we thank all of you that have joined us on Facebook today, or, or YouTube, whatever media you're watching. We ask that you be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Uh, we did not think about when we were here, if anybody had any special prayer.